started going through a period about 10 months ago where I was working at a general practice clinic. And after five years of doing that, I found myself stuck. And I started questioning why I stayed in this industry. This is a second, third, fourth, fifth career for me. And coming into it and going to tech school at 32 years old, that was a pretty significant decision, only to find myself two years later asking, why the hell did I do this? <laughs> So I made the leap and jumped from general practice to emergency and critical care, thinking, yeah, that's the change that I needed. And wow, was I dead right and wrong <laughs> at the same time. So I got my job working in the ER, and I was that fresh, shining face. And I was like, yeah, if you, you need help with that IV catheter, I'm your guy. I can do that. And sure, I can pick up that extra shift. And sure, no problem. I'll stay five hours after my shift ended to help you guys clean those kennels. And this was awesome, and it really was noted by my coworkers. And over time, as I continued doing that, I started noticing that I was having some significant health effects. My sleep started being affected, that was the first thing to go. And then from there, it went into my eating habits, and I started eating less, less frequently, eating things that I knew were going to um, wreak havoc on my body later. And um, then I just stopped eating altogether. And before I knew it, I would go 24 hours without eating. And I'm like, well, why do I feel like I'm going to fall over? And it's like, yeah, screw that. You haven't eaten in 26 hours. <laughs> so this went on, and I started to realize that this was actually trickling over into my actual performance at work. And the first thing I noticed there was I started to become a little bit more disconnected. And um, you know, at the end of my shift, I was ready to go at 1 AM. It's like, sorry, my shift is over. You guys have a great night. And before, I was that guy that was always willing to help and to be there for the patients. And what happened was I go home, and I'd be happy that I was home, but then that guilt of that patient that I know is going to wait longer for that pain medication because the staffing is so short right now, or that nauseous animal is going to be off of his IV fluids to rehydrate and get his antidiabetic longer because I left. And after listening to Alex talk, I'm like, wow, I am a martyr, great. <laughs> so in addition to being a stressed out neurotic mess most of the time, and a couple of my coworkers are out there, people that have worked with me now and in the past will definitely attest to that being true. I started to say, okay, something's gotta change. And I used to be really big in meditation uh, years ago, and I meditated daily. And it really, really changed my life. Somewhere along the line, I got complacent and I stopped doing that. And now I'm seeing the brave response of my body after doing that. Um, this has resulted in me being extremely um, uneven tempered at work. I'm snapping at my coworkers. And what has happened is now you have a 36 year old man throwing temper tantrums on the treatment floor. <laughs> and when you have to go to your clinic manager, your nursing supervisor and say, I am being a giant baby on the floor. And I recognize this, I know it, and I don't know how to stop it. And when you sit with your team at 12 o'clock in the morning after a long day, and I say, I have really screwed up here, and I'm sorry for that extra work I put on you. I need your help here. It's frighteningly humble to do that. And it's also extremely empowering. And then I noticed that that help is there. I just have to be able to specifically state I need it. And I'm sure that every single one of you in this room have been in that situation. So things kept progressing, which ultimately led to this paper that I have here. And this just was handed to me two days ago. And this was corrective disciplinary action from my employer. My performance had suffered to such a degree that the image that I was giving of myself and my teammates was of poor quality. In 14 years in clinical practice, I can be very aware and be the first one to say what my problems are. I've never had this happen to me, and I was devastated. My first reaction was, I gotta find something else to do. My patient care is suffering. Everything that I identify with professionally is at risk here, and I'm trapped. And that was my fight or flight response. So I started thinking about this weird thing that we call stress. So how many of you in this room have at some point said, I am really stressed out? <laughs> right. Now, out of those of you that raised your hand, I'd really love two or three of you to uh, be willing to answer a question for me. Any volunteers? Uh, Abby, right up front. So my question to you is, when you feel stressed, I just want to know, what is stress?
this a little thing. for you. Thanks for talking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Can I get one more person to tell me what they think stress is? Yeah. self-care kit for you. <laughs> oh, your head's on fire today. Okay, so we have two people experiencing the same feelings, the same emotion, with two completely different definitions for what it is. So how are we supposed to identify this weird thing out there that we all complain about when we don't even know what it is? There was a definition, the original definition of stress came back in 1936 when a German doctor stated that it was the body's nonspecific response to a demand for change. Okay, that tells me nothing. And then you start thinking about stress, or when you say, I'm stressed, what's going on in that situation? And you'll find that any stressful event is a demand for some degree of change. It's a demand for you to work harder. It's a demand for you to work faster. It's a demand for you to work better. It's a demand for you to look better to talk in a more diplomatic way. It's a constant demand and pressure that's put on us and we are expected to perform at 150% all the time. And when we don't, the first thing we do is we beat ourselves up because that's what us veterinary professionals love to do <laughs> and smarter. Um, and then we start this cascade of emotional distress that if it's not managed and addressed in the moment, it will consume you, I, I promise you that. Um, I've got thousands of dollars in medical bills for them to tell me there's nothing wrong with you. And I'm like, no, there's something very, very wrong with you. <laughs> and it literally comes down to not being able to manage my stress. So the problem with stress is that stress in and of its being itself, it's also the cause of itself and the result of itself. Think about that for a minute. And then it's like, okay, yeah, you guys, this is not getting cleared up at all. So when a stressful situation happens, our sensory organs, our eyes and our ears are going to send these signals to the amygdala in the brain, which is then going to send a signal to the hypothalamus. That's going to start to start this cascade of all of these chemical actions that are happening in your body before your body even really realizes that it's happening. Before you know it, you have this sudden surge of epinephrine that's immediately dumped into your bloodstream. Now, most of you in this room have given epinephrine to your patients, whether it's for a cardiopulmonary arrest or under anesthesia. And what kinds of things do you see it do to our patients? Heart rate increases, blood pressure increases, sometimes the respiration increases. It's doing all of those same things to us, and we're expected to work through that. As that continues, the stress response continues to go further, and then it goes into a second stage where it activates a whole nother set of things where it's going to actually ultimately end up releasing cortisol into your bloodstream. <coughs> cortisol is our body's natural stress hormone. Cortisol is the one that keeps that stress response going. It keeps that epinephrine flowing. So when we're under a constant chronic low level stress, it's basically the equivalent of a car running at idle for days and days and days. So if you start your car and just leave it running and just let it go, what's gonna happen? It's gonna die out, and our bodies are the same way. That constant surge of cortisol flowing through our bodies, it's inhibiting uh, insulin, so it's keeping more of that glucose in our bloodstreams. It's releasing stored glucose and fat from our bodies because it's saying, hey, we need this energy. We need to be able to run when we need to get out of here. And that's going to cause obesity. Obesity is gonna cause all kinds of other stress, mental, emotional, physical stress. It continues to affect the gastrointestinal system, the cardiac system. Every single autonomic response, the functions of your body are all being affected by this chemical surging through your bloodstream. And every single stressful incident that happens after that just keeps adding onto it. So picture yourself running around your life every single day with an epinephrine CRI hooked up to your veins. It's not gonna work out very well. You might get some work done, but you're gonna miss steps you're gonna be doing it to just get the task done, not to complete it right. And our patients are gonna suffer, and you're gonna suffer. And then you're gonna feel guilty about that, and then that's gonna cause stress. And it's just, it snowballs. 
And that's where a lot of people that choose to leave the industry end up falling. And that's where I found myself. And I thought, okay, in 14 years of clinical practice, if I can teach and lecture and teach my students and my new um, interns about stress management, taking care of yourself, and I didn't even see it happening. So does that make me a hypocrite? No, it just makes me a human being, a compassionate, hardworking individual. So what can we do about this stress? One of the best things that I've been able to use is practicing awareness and mindfulness. There are so many different types of meditation out there. And meditation is not sitting on top of a mountain wrapped in a sheet, humming to some you know, <laughs> off distant note. You can meditate in line at the grocery store. You can meditate in traffic on the way to work. Sometimes my meditations would be leaving a shift and taking that 10 minutes, giving myself 10 specific dedicated minutes to review the events of the day, think about how they affected me and how I could change my response to them. You can't change the stimulus. You can't stop the stress from happening. All we can do is adapt our response to the stress. And the first part is gonna be identifying it and knowing when it's happening. And that's where mindfulness and awareness comes in. There's a lot of different things that you can do um, to help you learn the mindfulness techniques, but basically it's taking a step back, bringing yourself and recentering your attention to the present. You're not worrying about how you're gonna feel tomorrow after your 20 hour shift with no breaks and you haven't peed in 16 hours. <laughs> you're not worrying about the treatment board that has seven hospitalized patients that all have orders up at the same exact time and they're all the same critical nature. You're focusing on you right now and how you're feeling. The most important thing about mindfulness is to acknowledge that emotion that you're feeling. Right now, I'm feeling angry. You have to give credit to the emotion that you're feeling because discrediting it is going to cause a lot of emotional damage down the line. So you acknowledge, yeah, I'm really pissed off right now. Graciously let it float on and send it on its way. Now, that's a lot easier said than done, and it does take a little bit of practice. Um, one of the ways that I learned to practice mindfulness was actually a uh, smartphone application called uh, Headspace. Yeah, that's good. It is by far the most laid back, relaxed subscription app for um, meditation, mindfulness meditation. And I definitely have realized the importance of that in my life, and I really, really need to get it back. Um, the importance of self-care taking care of yourself. And that is so hard to do when you come off of a 16 hour shift, you don't wanna stop and make yourself dinner. Who wants to do that? You just wanna eat and go to bed. You don't wanna get up and go for that jog because then you're gonna get all sweaty and you're gonna get tired and you're gonna get shin splints and then you gotta work and then you're just gonna whine the rest of the night or maybe that's just me. So you have to be able to take that time for yourself. Um, massages, yoga, tai chi, qigong, meditation in motion, whatever it takes. Right now, I'm sitting rubbing a crystal, okay? I've, I've worked with some people that have cracked up laughing at me because they find these random rocks around the clinic, and they're like, oh yeah, Henry was here. <laughs> or when I got into essential oils, or I got into acupuncture, I was desperately struggling to find anything to get me to a different state because I did not like the person that I was starting to become. So now I'm at this point where I've recognized it, I've acknowledged it, it's here, and I can't go back and I can't change my actions for where I've gotten now. All I can do is move forward. And we're hoping that today, we can get you guys a good start with creating your own wellness program. And that's where one of the um, our uh, sponsors, Massage Envy, has been awesome enough to donate complimentary one hour massages for all of you guys to get you guys started on your wellness journey. So hopefully you guys will that time. And when you take that time, don't think about work. Seriously, it is the hardest thing. I had a hell of a day yesterday, and I we were in the car, and my partner Matthew, I was complaining about something, and I was like, well, this is this. And he looked at me and he said, can you stop? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And then later, I start talking about something else, and I'm like, oh yeah, you know, the good thing about this, he's like, can you stop? <laughs> and he had to keep bringing me back. Try and get like an accountability partner, somebody that you work with that can call you out on these things in a gentle way, of course. <laughs> That's gonna know how you're going to respond, that they can say, hey, okay, pick a code word, hey, peanuts, and then only you and them know, and it's just like, okay, this one's losing her mind, and this one's actually saving his. Um, one of the other things I really urge you guys to do is to do a stress response inventory. We all think we know how we respond to stress, but seriously, take 
five, 10 minutes and do a open and honest inventory of how you feel you respond to stressful situations. And then I want you to keep that to yourself and then ask your family and ask your coworkers and ask your manager. And then take that and compare to what you wrote down of yourself. And the results will be kind of eye-opening. I was expecting a very, very negative response because that's me. I get programmed and I get wrapped up into, oh, well, you know, he always insists on taking his break or he always, you know, has to do this. And the feedback that I got was amazing. And I'm like, how did I convolute this into being a negative thing? So we have to do a lot of self-work. We have amazing, amazing people in this industry and we all certainly didn't go into it for the money. We went into it to care for our patients. 